Hello, hello, hello. My name is Allison Gavlitz. I am a bookseller with Barnes & Noble. I am so excited today to interview Becky Chambers, um, the author of A Psalm for a Wild Built, which came out last summer, and the follow-up, A Prayer for the Crown Shy, which is out now. Becky, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. I'm excited to talk to you. Um, before we get started, can you, or to get us started, can you just give um, a quick rundown of the, of the book? A Prayer for the Crown Shy. Um, because I, I know the titles to my own books, is the sequel to um, A Psalm for the Wild Builds, the second of my monk and robot novellas. The premise of the books is uh, they take place on a moon called Panga, which is where human beings live and always have, because I say so. And um, several centuries ago, um, Panga was in a, a, a situation that might be familiar to us. They are on the verge of of uh, ecological collapse due to um, rampantly unsustainable production and consumption. And uh, their factories are all staffed, by lack of a better word, by robots. And for reasons that to this day, no one understands, uh, one day the robots all woke up en masse, they gained sentience. And uh, to humanity's credit, um, we were cool about it. And we s invited them to become uh, citizens, equal citizens of human society. Uh, but the robots said, no, uh, no, thank you very politely. But, um, they said, we're not interested in that. We would like to see what the world is like without you. We want to, um, observe and understand the natural world. And so they left all of them, uh, wandered off into the wilderness, have not been heard from since everybody knows this is history, but by this point, Robots have become urban legend, kind of like nobody's seen one, nobody's interacted with one in centuries. Um, so there's just this distant thing that doesn't really affect your everyday life. Uh, the protagonist of these books is Sibling Dex. Sibling Dex is a traveling monk, um, and they they go from village to village, uh, dispensing tea and comfort. And in the first book, uh, they encounter Mosscap, um, a wild built robot. Um, who is seeking out humanity, basically, to see how we've gotten along um, without them and, and how society has evolved and what humans still need. Uh, the first book is largely about the, um, the relationship between Dex and Mosscap. They spend time in the wilderness figuring themselves out, as, as we all need to do from time to time. Um, Prayer for the Crown Shy takes place um, after that. No spoilers here, but they they depart from the wilderness, they head into the villages of Panga and begin to interact with the various different communities there. Um, so this book is, is kind of a road trip book in a way of them um, traveling through the world a bit, um, stories about the, the people they encounter there and the conversations they have along the way. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so I have to say that you strike quite a tone from the first sentence in the Psalm for the Wild Built. Um, by saying sometimes a person reaches a point in their life when it becomes absolutely essential to get the F out of the city. As a New Yorker, I get it. <laughs> I was instantly in Dex's mindset and fully felt that emotion. It is such a great beginning. Could you just talk to that? Absolutely. So I grew up in Los Angeles. Um, I was, you know, uh, born and bred there. Um, and then I have lived in cities for most of my life since I went to school in San Francisco um, I have lived in every, everywhere I've hopped around to, I have lived in a city. And uh, six years ago, my wife and I moved to uh, Humboldt County, California, which is the, the rural tippy top north of the state. Um, for those of you who are watching on video, you can see the, the redwoods out my window. Um, it was very much that feeling. Um, we had sort of a, a convergence of events in that we were uh, losing the place we were renting because our, our landlord had decided to sell. And also I, I was in a place where I could go full-time in writing books. And we just decided, what if we didn't spend all of our money on rent anymore? <laughs> we went somewhere quiet. Um, so we literally just uh, got in the car and drove until we found somewhere we liked and we liked here. So um, that was that was the impetus for that. I think that Dex is hunger for um, something quieter, something a little more in touch with the world as it exists without us is something not everyone feels, but I think a lot of people do. Writing it here, um, surrounded by, by trees and critters and whatnot, um, it, was, it was very easy to tap into that and to uh, so much of the, the wilderness of Panga is, um, 
is inspired by the world outside my door. Um, everyone romanticizes starting out in a new town like Dex does. Um, and, and they go into it with such open arms and hope. I love, love this character. They're so human and true. And when starting out their tea service they, and don't ask for help, Dex is like so many people who want to be a pro at everything from the beginning. And it's hard to give ourselves grace in doing that. Is that something you relate to? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I am uh, my harshest critic by far. And uh, I'm definitely uh, not immune to the thing of, oh, well, that looks easy. I could just do that. And then finding myself completely lost <laughs> in the middle of it. I think that anytime um, anyone starts out on any new endeavor, be it professional or otherwise, there is that moment where you have to swallow your own ego and just realize I have no idea what I'm doing and I have to make this up as I go along. Um, and I still feel that way a lot of the time. I think that a lot of writers do, you know, whenever, whenever I get the, oh, how do you write a book question? Every time I'm like, I have no idea. I've been doing this for 10 years now. I have no idea how I write a book. That, that level of, of both humility, but also constant, very low key struggle was something I really wanted to communicate with Dex because I, I didn't want them to be um, instantly good at this. They are good at their profession, but it's because of work and because of effort and because they, they really put the time into it and they are still learning every day how to go about it. And to me, I, I find that more compelling than a character who is some kind of prodigy or just instantly picks things up. I think it's more relatable because it's how most of us go through the world. They have this this real fear of people looking at them and thinking that they're stupid or that this is um, not the right thing when clearly they know that it is, they just don't know the next steps to take. And I mean, that's, that is a boat we are all familiar with. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's exactly it. It is the switching of the, of the career, the trying something new where in, in our minds, like, and, and Dex says it in the book, it's new to you, but I've been thinking about this for a long time. And I right. think that's true where it's something we all kind of ruminate on and think like, okay, I'm ramping myself up. And so to everybody else, it may be a surprise, but to us, it's like, no, I'm doing this. Like, you don't know how to do it. You don't know anything about it. You're like, I know, but I just got to do it. So it, he's just such a wonderful character. And it was so wonderful to see myself through that, to be like, oh, I, okay, I, I get it. And to, yes, have grace with yourself too, to just be okay with not being an expert. And, and it, I, yeah, it's a helpful character, I think, to relate to. Thank you. What is it about tea that is so dang calming? <laughs> what is it about tea? There's a lot. Of, I could talk about tea a lot. The, the reason I went with tea as, as opposed to all the other, the other things I could choose. Um, so, so Dex being, um, a disciple of a God who is the God of small comforts, right. And that can mean a lot of different things. I decided after a bit of trial and error that they were, they were going to, to serve tea to, to people who need it. The thing about a cup of tea is it's in, in a lot of ways, completely meaningless. It's nothing. It's a beverage. Like it is not the defining point of your day, right? But a good cup of tea can really change the entire mood of your day. Yeah. It can save your afternoon, you know? Yeah. It's the warmth, it's the flavor. I think it's also the fact that it takes time. By definition, you have to wait a little bit for a cup of tea. And maybe that's just three minutes, you mm -hmm. know, or maybe 10 or, you know, depending depending on the brew you have. But you you have to boil water and you have to wait before you drink it. And I think that it sounds so simple, but it's something um, we, we kind of lack in the world as it is right now. We're used to things being fast and instant. And yes, three minutes is not a lot of time, but it is a longer amount of time than we typically wait for things. We're used to being able to, you know, um, just eat something, you know, straight out of the can or, you know, the bottle or what have you. We're used to being able to access all the information of the world instantly. A cup of tea forces you to prepare and to wait. And it's also one of those things where if someone else makes it for you, it's the nicest thing in the world. You know, I know that there are, there are many a day when my wife comes and brings me a cup of tea to my office and, you know, very little else is said usually, but it, it makes you feel loved and it makes you feel comfortable. And it really, really can be the difference between feeling exhausted and just, you know, feeling like, okay, I can do this. You know, you take that one little moment to, to center yourself and to do something that is nice for you. Um, there, are, there are a lot of things about tea that I think we kind of take for granted because it is so simple and throw away. You don't need it, but it does help. There are so many themes that run through these books. And one of the first ones that stuck with me is remnants, which is when Mosscap is explaining to Dex 
that they have many different parts that have to come together to create them. And within those, there are leftover reactions to various experiences. We all have that, whether it's traumatic or a positive reaction, and it's for us to figure out how to deal with it and hold space for it in our lives without it taking over us. I thought this chapter so eloquently explained that through a robot. Can you speak to that? I'm interested in consciousness. Just to put it extremely simply, I'm interested in the hidden parts of our brains that we don't understand and probably never can. Um, I'm interested in how we're just this mix of memory and the way we spin those memories and also, you know, the things that are baked into us from a, a genetic evolutionary standpoint. Uh, things, for example, like how most people are scared of spiders. I'm not. I apparently lack that gene, but like most people are. Most people will jump when they see something little and crawly running across the floor or a snake or what have you. We have these things that we don't really understand um, that we knee jerk about on the flip side outside of fear. We all like the side of water and we all like green things. These are very, very deep biological traits of ours. And I wanted to play with that in a machine context as well, because one of the one of the ideas about consciousness in general that I'm I'm trying to get across with these books, and I've touched on in my other works as well, is that it, consciousness is not something we understand. It's not really something we can engineer, I believe. Um, we can design software to do very specific tasks, very specific types of thinking. Um, but when it comes to sentient self-awareness, like like true uh, personhood, for lack of a better term, I'm not sure that that's something we can easily replicate because we don't understand it about ourselves. And so I wanted to make it clear with the robots in this book that we don't understand why it is we woke up. And because of that, they have a lot of things. They don't think exactly like us, but they there, there are aspects that we can relate to in that there are things that Moscap is afraid of or things that Moscap finds familiar in ways that it can't, it does not have a context for. And that's born out of the fact that it is built out of the remains of robots that came before. And that's me thinking about my primate ancestors. It's me with the little things in my day where it's clear that I have some root in my childhood somewhere that doesn't like X or really likes X. And I, I don't know why. Um, I, I felt that that was, um, it, first of all, just an, just an aspect of, of you know, our thinking experience that I, I, I chew on a lot with no conclusion. Um, but also I thought it, it made Moscap and the other robots feel more real and relatable and like, like full um, thinking beings. You know, I didn't want Moscap to understand every part of itself the way that robots and androids typically do, where it's like, oh, you just fixed the circuit here and blah, 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 you know, and no, there are, there are so many things about Moscap that Moscap itself doesn't get. It's so funny because we are just these beings that do have all of these things that we're just trying to figure it out. And it's so funny when we all feel so alone because it's like, dude, everybody has this. And it's, 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 we all just go through life. And we're like, I don't know what to do. Should I go do this? I don't want to ask for help. I'm going to let everybody down. It's so interesting that, and I do love that Moscap has it too, because it is such a, great way to be like nobody has it figured out not even robots yeah. isn't that amazing <laughs> that's definitely something i i lean on hard in the second book as well because we're seeing moss cap out of its comfort zone mm -hmm. for the first time um it hasn't interacted with other humans outside of decks and it's very early on realizes that it's it's out of its depth and it doesn't have any idea what it's doing even though it also has just knows that this is the right thing has marched forward out of the woods to do this and as soon as it gets there very similar to dex um stepping into a new profession and going i have no idea what i'm doing you know moss cap does the same um and that was also i enjoyed writing that aspect of their relationship in the second book because Mo because dex has already come across that hurdle and they can help in that regard and it was it was nice to um, not flip that dynamic. It's just a natural growth of that dynamic. I think that something um, you know something that that Dex struggled with and still struggles with is now something um, they can help Moscap with as well. One of the things I love most about the books is how Dex and Moscap become such good friends. It shows us that we can find friendship and comfort in the most unexpected places. And sometimes those are the most deepest and meaningful relationships. 
And I love those. Do you have those? Was this an honor of anyone? Not anyone specifically, but very much the, the, the people I am close to. I, ha- I am truly, truly lucky to have um, an incredible group of friends, small but close, which is, is the way I like it. Um, and that, that is a quality that I wanted to, um, to, to inject into Dex and Moscap's relationship as well, that they are just comfortable with each other and that they understand each other in a way that other people don't. And sometimes that's something that takes a lot of discussion. There's obviously lots of times where they don't, they have to pause for a second and figure each other out. Um, but that they are also people who can share a silence um, or, um, you know, a really simple activity, you know, just sitting and watching a river or, you know, just walking down the road, looking at flowers. Like they, I, I, I do have people like that in my life and I value them immensely more than anything. And, um, yeah, so they're, they're, they're threads of that all through their relationship. And I love that from almost the get-go, they were so comfortable with each other too, which I think is also so telling. They were both, both not to say that they weren't unsure and figuring each other out and they didn't have to, fig- and you know, talk about some things like you said, but they were just like, yeah, come as you are. Let's, mm-hmm. let's do this and let's go discover. And I, I just, I'm very lucky to have friends like that too. And it's so amazing. And it's such, it's so nice. It's such a safe place. And I think that's part of what comes through in the books too, is they both feel safe to be vulnerable with each other and to challenge each other. And it's just such a beautiful friendship that you've written with those two. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to hear that because it was, it was really fun to write. It was, um, you know, I, I wanted it to be something that felt comfortable for people to read, but it also was a comfort for me to write. It was a real pleasure to write those two. That's so nice. In Psalm for the Wild Built, Dex asks how the idea of maybe being meaningless can sit well with Moscap. And it responds, because I know that no matter what, I'm wonderful. (laughs) I had to sit on that before I kept reading. I have to tell you, I put the book down and was like, wow, that's amazing. Um, And there are so many delightful messages in this, in these books that are unexpected, but pack quite the punch. Is that your intention? Do you hope people read it that way? I mean, it's my hope that people pick things up like that, but if you don't, that's okay. Um, as I say in my dedication in the first book, um, it, the, the primary intent of these books is to feel, is, is, is to take a break, is to, is to have something you can just curl up with for an afternoon. This is a book that is not going to hurt you. It's not going to, um, you know, and I, I think that um, that's so uh, vital in this day and age to, to be able to just be able to pause for a second. I want the book to feel like a cup of tea as well. If all it is, is just a little bit of comfort in your afternoon and you don't think about anything further, fine. Um, but I did put things in there that I wanted, I, I wanted to give you the option of being, of chewing on some of the stuff in there. One of the, the, the big impetus for this book was, um, I was looking at the way my friends and I, everybody in my circle were approaching uh, consuming new media in, um, you know, sort of the, the late 2010s, early 2020s. I do not need to explain to everyone how stressful this time has been. We're living in this golden age of, of new stuff, new TV shows, video games, books, like everything that's coming out is awesome. Um, and I would commonly find myself saying this phrase of, oh yeah, that sounds real. I've heard such good things. I'll definitely get to that. But what I was actually watching and consuming as a lot of people I knew were, were old favorites from when I was a kid shows that I've watched 10,000 times um, and kids shows. Uh, My wife uh, watched great British bake off. I don't know how many times, you know, and that sort of thing. And I really looked at that going, I Comfort seems to be the thing we are all seeking out. And I found myself sometimes in, in this uh, sort of dilemma where I wanted to be consuming something that spoke to me where I am now. I didn't necessarily want to be watching the same thing I watched when I was 10 years old or a show that is intended for 10 year olds now. But given the choice between something new that was like really tense and gritty or something you know, ch- like that I associate with childhood that was comforting, I went for comfort every single time. And so what I really wanted to do with these books was be like, okay, what is, can I write something that has that same level, level of comfort as watching a cartoon, as watching Bake Off, that sort of thing, 
but it speaks to you as an adult. It speaks to you where you're at now. It gives you um, problems, conundrums, things to chew on that you will relate to um, at this point in your life. Um, you know, can, can I make something that feels that comforting, but is still for adults? So that was, that's why there is that chewy stuff in these books, because I wanted, um, I wanted it to speak to our age group. I wanted it to, to speak to people who um, do want something to think about and do want to, to wrestle with the nuances of life, but also just want to curl up in a chair for a couple hours and be quiet. I definitely, it's funny that you say that. I definitely experienced that with this book. I actually um, heard somewhere that nostalgia is the experience without the anxiety. Mm. And I was like, whoa, that for me is huge. I think that's why, especially during this time, you know, we went back to the books we liked and the movies we liked, because it was kind of that comfort to your point. And I definitely took that with your, with your um, books, you know, there's always something of like something bad's going to happen. What, like, what am I getting into? And it was just such a, a hopeful, calming, lovely kind of um, a way to leave, leave, you know, the real world for a little bit. So I love that you wrote that because I definitely experienced that. And it was a very um, charming book that I almost wanted to hug when I was done. I was like, I love these <laughs> characters. I love this world. I love their adventures. So I, I love that you wrote it like that. In a prayer for the crown shy, at one point, Dex and Leroy are contemplating with Moss Cap about giving him a part to repair himself and itself. And the idea of are you or aren't you, your body comes up. Um, we do get to have autonomy over so much of our body. I have tattoos and piercings that I got without even thinking about it. Um, but there's so much of our body that we don't have autonomy over. Um, it was such an con interesting conversation to read right now in the midst of everything going on. Can you speak to that? Sure. So the, 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 the dilemma that they're talking about is that uh, Moss Cap has had a, com a, a component break with, within itself. And um, culturally, robots don't fix themselves. They could, they, they technologically, they could live forever technically, you know, if, if they just kept replacing bits of themselves, but they don't because um, they, they revere nature so much. They want to understand nature so much that they, they see that everything else ages and dies. And so they let themselves do the same because they don't feel that they can actually understand the organic world if they, if they don't do that. And so for, for Moscap, it's this real conundrum because it's it's a very simple part um but it um you know it's something that's causing them real problems and dex does not understand why moss cap is having such an issue with this this is something we could fix really easily and they have to go through these um you know like really tying themselves in knots figuring out how can we fix this in a way that is is culturally acceptable to you um, and, and can we even do that? And I think that was the first part of that whole, um, that whole issue that was really important to me was that I didn't want Dex to force a viewpoint onto Mosscap about it. And I didn't want Dex to sort of strong arm Mosscap into doing this. And, and I, I, I tried to make that clear that, that Dex is aware of that as well. It, like they understand almost from the jump that th this is a cultural difference and this is something that is extremely important to Moss Cat. And so it's not a matter of arguing that point of, I think your viewpoint is stupid. I think this is nonsense. It's okay, well, given that, what can we do? Like, is there a solution within this? And, um, and it takes Moss Cat a long time to think about it. Like it has to step away when um, various you know, solutions are presented and it has, it has, it doesn't sleep, but it, you know, it takes a night to think about it um, because it's doing something that, that robots do not typically do. And um, I, I just, I wanted to highlight um, that, you know, the, the, the intense um, intimacy of our relationship to our bodies there and that these things are culturally determined, you know, um, I likewise have tattoos. There are a bazillion different cultural impressions like or subculture impressions on what those mean. And that's been true for all of history. Um, you know, some people get them on a whim. Some people get them with a lot of thought. Some people don't want to get them at all. You know, it's, it, it's that. That too is a very, a very human experience. Um, and, 
it was just um, yet another example in those books that I wanted to show um, to highlight both the, the the difference between the culture of robots and and us, um, but also making it clear that you know we can navigate those things respectfully, and that you don't have to understand it and you don't have to agree with it in order to respect it, in order to figure out, okay, what's the solution that works for you? And ultimately giving MossCap agency over that decision. If MossCap had decided that it would prefer to just sit down in the middle of the road and rust, that would be its choice. Um, it wouldn't have been one that Dex would have agreed with, but in the end, Dex would have been like, okay, fine, do you? Um, so <laughs> um, that was, yeah, I actually really, I really enjoyed writing that chapter for that reason. Um, those Those sorts of little, Cultural puzzles are, are something um, I, I've i loved in almost every book I've written. It's something I probably will write forever. It was interesting to read because I was Camp Dex, where I was like, yeah, obviously you're a robot. Put a new part, you know, and, and they were, and they were, it was an easy part to get. So it was interesting for me too, to, to think about that other side and be like, oh yeah, that's, that's true. It, it is um, its decision and, and it gets to decide. And, and I loved the time it took to step away and think about it. And I did, I think it was just another example of Dex and Moss Cap's friendship where they both had the respect to have that conversation as well. And, you know, say, well, this is why I think that, and these are all the reasons why you should do it. And this is why I think this and why I shouldn't do it. And, and to another conversation and friendship that they handled with such grace. And, um, it, it was an, a wonderful conversation that opened my eyes as well. Let's talk about Dex going home and the enormity of it, but also the smallness of it at the same time. If anyone's left home, I'm sure they've experienced that. Um, they, Dex was so welcomed and so understood, but so nervous about it at the same time. And isn't that kind of the way it is for all of us going home? I think so. You, you, you leave and you come back. And even though most things are the same, there is that moment of like, oh, that story I used to know isn't there anymore. It, it, it's both sides of it are surreal, right? The, um, you know, the things that are still there that haven't changed, where you're just like, oh my God, that's still there. You're coming back as this very changed person, but that thing is still exactly where it was. Um, but also the things that aren't, that this place has changed without you as well. And I think um, for, for anyone who has left home before that, that's uh, just part and parcel of the experience it's a weird it's weird it changes you in a way that you cannot unchange you you know the the old cliche of you can't go home again you can't um and even though the people there love you you've had this whole life away from them you have changed they have changed and so you're constantly sort of going back to this this love that grew together and has continued while you're apart but you have to figure out who you are now. And even though, um, you know, Dex keeps in touch with their family, they, they visit their family when they can, you know, it's not like Dex is estranged or something like that, but things have changed since they've been away. And this experience that Dex is having with Moscow is massively changing them. And that's something they have to, um, you know, introduce their family to as well, both literally and, and metaphorically. And, um, I think that that, I mean, to me, that's the most key part of, of going away and coming back, of having to figure out how to explain to these people that you love, that you care about, you're not the same anymore and trying to understand how they're not. It can be um, a difficult thing and it can be a bittersweet thing. And I think that even if you are excited to go to that place, there is that fear Similarly to what we were talking about earlier about how you don't, you know, of, of with them, um, I'm, I'm going to, you know, change my job. I'm going to do this thing. I've been thinking about it for a long time, but this is brand new to you. We do get defensive and we do get protective of that. You know, what if I go back and they don't like me anymore? You know, what if I go back and we don't connect in the same way anymore? What if this thing that I think is really meaningful isn't now? What if we've grown apart, not for any um you know, sort of hurtful reason or traumatic reason, but just because that's what people do. Um, the All of that are, uh, is things that go hand in hand with coming home. And um, I, I, I very much wanted to highlight that with, with Dex's experience of going back. It was very sweet. Um, I think it was his mom um, who, you know, he, uh, excuse me, Dex went off at one point and said, I just, I just need a minute. And their mom was like, 
I know, like, you know, if she, if she kind of knew to give them space. And, and I think that's the comfort of it is those people know us so well that they know exactly mm-hmm. what we need. And so that is like at that fundamental deep level there, that's where I think the comfort comes from. And then yes, all the other things you talked about that many things change and it is, have we grown together? Have we grown apart? It, it, that it is a very um, nuanced experience. I wanted to make it clear too, with Dex, Dex being a queer character, I, I wanted to make it incredibly clear that it wasn't that Dex left home because they weren't welcome there. Mm-hmm. Um, Dex is close with their family. Their family adores them. But Dex is someone who just needs to go, who just needs to be elsewhere. This place where Dex grew up didn't fit them. And not because of any, um, you know, not because of an unkind reason, not because of a, um, a hurtful reason. Um, it was because they just needed to be somewhere else. And I, I, I think that it, that's something that was really, really important for me to get across that this is a world in which Dex can be themselves effortlessly um, and without fear, without any need to hide um, that the reason they are on the road and that they live this very solitary life is just because they're a solitary person and their family gets that. There isn't any guilt about having left. There isn't any guilt about their need to you know, sort of back away from the chaos going on in the kitchen and just step away for a bit. They're a quiet person and that's respected. Nobody is trying to force them to be, you know, an extrovert when they are not. Um, and that that was just, you know, an, uh, yet another layer of icing on the fact that this is this is a safe world and this is a place where you can have the freedom to explore any aspect of yourself um, and nobody's going to judge you for it. We have to talk about the lands you created. They were all individual and beautiful sounding and exactly where I want to go if I wanted to get out of the city. Were they based on anywhere? Um, so, oh gosh, let's see. Um, so the woodlands are definitely based on where I live in Humboldt County. I mean, I think that's um, very obvious if you've ever hung out in the redwoods that I'm, that I'm yeah. talking about the same thing. A lot of the places there are uh, in the book as well. Um, so the uh, the shrublands, which is the um, the the very pastoral um, farmlands, that too is is based on you know my time here in in Northern California, not here in the the north north, but um, down in wine country, down through the valley, that sort of thing. Um, I all of that is all of those are places where I have felt um, very connected to the. The landscape around me. I was I was really trying to summon places where I had felt quiet and I had felt safe, and I didn't feel a need to reinvent the wheel on those things because I think you know again my my goal with so much of this was to to be relatable to 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 create environments that a person could very quickly and naturally relax in. The person here being the reader, of course, um, you know. So yeah, writing about beautiful meadows and fields. That's a classic, you know, as is, as is um, you know, a rugged coastline that too is very Northern California. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I didn't, I didn't have to think too far afield um, when writing these places. I thought of, I just thought of places that I thought were beautiful and tried to, uh, tried to capture those in the page as best as I could. Now we are a book company, so I just have to ask, of course, what are you reading or what have you read? What are some of your favorite books? Things I have read lately, I just read uh, Spear by Nicola Griffith, which was fantastic. It was so, it was one of those books where, I don't know if you do this, where you kind of like press your forehead against it when you're done. You're just like, oh, it's so good because you want to just consume the whole thing. Um, Let's see. I also, I recently read How to Do Nothing by uh, by Jenny O'Dell, which was fantastic. That's so Uh, perfect for this conversation. I know, right? It was (laughs) Um, but yes, I, I read it. I read it after the fact. Um, one of my friends had read it and he's like, you gotta read this book. And I was like, okay. And it's a book that's incredibly difficult to talk about because by design, it's not something you can sum up in a, in a, you know, in just a quick blurb or a tweet. It is something you really have to sit with. Um, it's a beautiful book. And if you are drawn to any of, any of the themes we have been discussing today, I would highly, highly recommend it. Uh, my TBR pile is enormous and it's kind of an unfair question (laughs) (laughs) 
I will say that, um, you know, I'm, I'm headed out on tour next month. And so I, I do what I call is my homework, which is I try to, you know, um, read the, uh, the latest things by um, people I am doing events with along the way so that we can, so that we can have good conversations. Um, one of which is I'm, I'm doing an event with uh, Rika Aoki, who did this incredible book, um, Light from Uncommon Stars which I read last year. Um, it was one of my favorite things that I read last year. It's if you like um, hopeful, beautiful, weird, um, just delightful, but will also break your heart sort of fiction. I can't, I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, that's actually sitting on my table to be read next. I'm very excited to read it. It's great. Yeah. Becky Chambers, 2019 Hugo Award winner for the Wayfarer series. Thank you so, so, so much. It has been a pleasure to talk to you. I loved your books. Thank you for giving us this time today. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful conversation and I've, I've really enjoyed being here. Hello, readers. Welcome to another TBR Top Off, where we recommend books for you to pick up when you come in for your copy of A Prayer for the Crown Shy. I'm Becky, coming to you from my store in Westchester, Ohio, and I'm always joined with... Mark, hello! <laughs> oh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started uh, today. Well, first of all, I have to say, I'm very excited for this book. I, I actually need to dive into this, this series, I think, because it's a very hopeful and utopic um, kind of spin on sci-fi, and, and that is something that's been missing in a lot of sci-fi lately. It's all dystopic and sad and depressing. And so I love this hopeful spin on, on, you know, on society. So in thinking about that, and also thinking of this uh, robot, who is one of the main characters in Prayer for the Crown Shy and for that series, I actually kind of went back to one of the originals and one of the classics uh, with iRobot by Isaac Asimov. Nice. So yeah, um, this basically is uh, just one of those classics. If you haven't read it, if you haven't seen the movie uh, back in 2004, Will Smith did a movie. I thought it did a great job. I sure. enjoyed it. Um, I really enjoyed Alan Tudyk as the voice of Sonny Lee, the mm. robot. Anyway, this is uh, basically it introduces the three robot laws. Uh, number one is that a robot cannot harm a human uh, or through inaction allow a human to be harmed. Uh, number two is that a robot must obey orders given by humans unless they um, conflict with law number one. And then number three is that a robot must protect its own existence unless it <laughs> uh, conflicts with laws one and two. So that seems easy enough. Sure. sure. Uh, so... Um, but what it, it does is introduces the idea of robots that um, become aware of their own intelligence and their own power and, uh, and maybe that they are smarter and stronger than their human counterparts. And if that's the case, then why do they have to follow law number two? Uh, so it's, yeah, it, it's just an interesting uh, idea. And I think just as we look, you know, at any sci-fi books that involve robots, it's just a fun idea of looking into can robots and humans coexist? Uh, and then, and really, and what, what does humanity mean uh, if it's not embodied by an actual human? Something just to, to dig into. If you've never read it, definitely check it out. Like I said, it is iRobot by Isaac Asimov. Mark, what do you have? Oh, classic sci-fi. <laughs> I love it. Um, I went a post-apocalyptic kind of dystopia route, but does have um, some charm and oh. some hopefulness attached to it. I like that. So I picked a book called A Boy and His Dog at the End of the World by mm. C.A. Fletcher. Uh, I mean, the title alone is right? just... Oh. <laughs> um, so this follows... Um, teenage Grizz, who lives on an island that was formerly Scotland uh, with his family and his dogs. And one day a traveler comes to do some trading and leaves with Grizz's dog. Hmm. And Grizz is bound determined to get this dog back. Almost in like a John Wick scenario, but not as like severe and, ah. and murdery. Um, <laughs> but he embarks on this journey to track this dog down that he is absolutely loyal to and goes on some crazy, crazy adventures uh, with some huge twists, especially towards the end. 
The thing I liked about this book is that it does have an eagerness um, attached to it that feels very charming because of the young protagonist, but I just really appreciate a dystopian or a post-apocalyptic book that doesn't shy away from hope and from the important things in life, like love, loyalty, um, humanity, honesty, uh, these pieces that I think when you consider the big picture of end of the world and all of the people and the plague and, and, you know, destruction, those things are the things we still have to attach ourselves to. And then the reader can say, oh, well, I can attach this to myself now. I don't have to wait for a giant apocalypse to destroy everything to remind myself that you can be hopeful and loyal and, and you can do those things right now while the world is doing okay. Uh, so that is A Boy and His Dog at the End of the World by C.A. Fletcher. It's fantastic. I love that. Yes. Oh, so, sweet. yeah. So that's all we have for today. Um, thank you so much for tuning in to Poured Over. Please make sure to give us a rating and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Um, I am Mark. I am Becky. You can follow our home store at BN Westchester. Thanks so much for tuning in and happy reading, everybody. Happy Take Bye. care. Bye bye. Board Over is a Barnes and Noble production. The show is available on Apple, Spotify, and Stitcher. Please rate and review us wherever you listen to podcasts.